Thank you, Patrice, and thanks to all the wonderful people at Gagosian who have done so much to make this event happen. Uh, I was asked by Edmund to put this evening together to, in some ways, reflect, I think, the collaboration, uh, the, how would you say, the conversation between him and Sally. As, as Patrice said, they're both artists who, for whom the word is an integral part of what they do. And so uh, Edmund loves poetry. It's one of the things that brought us together in the first place. And he asked me to create a little evening. So I thought I would invite two poets that I really love, uh, Elisa Gonzalez, who's new book, Grand Tour, we just published, and Terrence Hayes, whom I've always admired a lot, and who is also a visual artist. He told me he, he's done all the covers for his books, which really amazed me and impressed me. So we're going to do a kind of round robin tonight where each of these poets is going to read something that they want to read. I'm going to read a few poems from the anthology that represent the history of FSG and have some relation to what's happening here tonight. Not too close, but... Uh, and then our, our artists will say a few words, and then we'll be open to talk to you all. So let's begin with Elisa. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and thank you everyone for being here. Um, I'm actually deviating from the script a little bit um, because of a conversation that I had with Edmund before the uh, before this began. Um, so I'm going to read a poem called uh, "After My Brother's Death." I reflect on the Iliad which is a much more explicit engagement with art and elegy than. After my brother's death, I reflect on the Iliad. The water cuts out while shampoo still clogs my hair. The nurse who swabs my nose hopes I don't have the virus, it's a bitch. The building across from the cemetery calls itself life storage. My little brother was shot, I tell the barista who asks how things have been and tip extra for her inconvenience. We speak only to the dead, someone tells me, to comfort, I assume, or inspire. But I take it literally as I am wont, even my shut up and fuck and let's cook tonight. Those are for you, Stephen. You won't come to me in my dreams, so I must communicate by other avenues. A friend sends an image from Cy Twombly's 50 Days at Ilium, a red bloom, the words like a fire that consumes all before it, and asks, have you seen this? It's at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. If I have, I can't remember, though I did visit with you when you were 11 or 12, when you tripped silent alarm after silent alarm, skating out of each room as guards jostled in, and I, though charged with keeping you from trouble, joined the game, and the whole time we never laughed, not till we were released into the grand air we couldn't touch and could. You are dead at twenty-two. As I rinse dishes, fumble for keys, buy kale and radishes, in my ear, Priam repeats, I have kissed the hand of the man who killed my son. Would I do that? I ask as I pass the store labeled signs, signs. I've studied the mugshot of the man who killed you. I can imagine his hands. Of course I would. Each finger, even. To hold your body again. And to resurrect you. Who knows what I am capable of, if I were. Nights, I replay news footage, your blood on asphalt, sheen behind caution tape. 
Homer's similes, I've been told, are holes cut in the cloth between the world of war and another more peaceful world. On rereading, I find even there a man kills his neighbor. Let Achilles cut me down as soon as I have taken my son into my arms and have satisfied my desire for grief. This, my mind's new refrain, in the pharmacy queue, in the train's rattling frame. The same friend and I discuss a line by Zbigniew Herberg, where a distant fire is burning like a page of the Iliad. It's nearly an ontological question, my friend says, the instability of reference. The fires and the pages of the poem, the literal page, set a fire. We see double. You are the boy in the museum, you are the body consumed, ash. Alone in a London museum, I saw a watercolor of twin flames, one black, one a gauzy red, only to learn the title is Boats at Sea. It's like how sometimes I forget you're gone. But it's not like that, is it? Not at all. When in this world, similes carry us nowhere. And now I see again the boy pelting through those galleries, a boy not you, a flash of red, red, chasing or being chased. Or did I invent him? Mischief companion, brother, listen to me, plead for your life, though even in the dream I know you're already dead. How do I ensure my desire for grief is never satisfied? Was Priam's ever I tell my friend, I want the page itself to burn. Uh, I like, uh, I, I love that that came back. Satisfy one's desire for grief versus resisting grief is a really high line in that. <laughs> to bring that back around. Um, okay, so I'm going to read you a poem from this middle section, which were all these kind of quarantine quatrains is what I would call them. Um, even though, you know, in the quarantine, this is like October, so we're kind of out of quarantine, but I'm so thinking about quarantine, even though it was like museum and minimum maybe, or people rhyming with people, it's debatable whether that's true or not, whether those things rhyme. Um, and I also will say, even though they're sort of moving around through the quatrains, this idea that maybe uh, every museum should have one painting in it. And the gallery comes close, right? That, you know, the overwhelming feel, feeling we have sometimes going to museums. And maybe every book should have one poem in it that you would just want to sit with one thing as opposed to sort of very quickly trying to consume it all. So that's sort of the initiating premise. And then it does other things. Uh, what else? Muscular fantasy. I was also playing the piano. So this is actually after Sati. He's got this series of poems called like uh, Furnishing Music. Anyway, okay, so muscular fantasy. I was thinking about that museum with just the one painted stamp. People pay big money to stare at minimum an hour at a time by a painter of people who have been old for a very long time. Sarah Beth of Paducah, old Walter Tom outside Paris Island, the most senior clients of the most low country senior homes. There used to be a country where no sad songs were allowed out loud because making the king blue was outlawed. The girl falling down the well sang without pause as she fell. People described it as gospel. The boy in the well sang as well as a small bell, and people said it sounded like babble. Rising in lifelike detail from the middle of the stamp-sized painting is an ornate mountain. My people moved further south to the beaches instead of moving north after Reconstruction. Blessed, my father said when I asked him if he'd rather be blessed or lucky. Soda in a can tastes better than soda in a bottle, but beer in a bottle tastes better than beer in a can. It's better plus less stressful to think the best of people. The worst thing about scared people is they go around scaring other people. Who you are with your mama, people, is not who you are with other people. The color of my mother's thumbs up emoji is unchanged, 
either because she's not estranged by such things or because she does not know the shade of her thumb can be changed. The painter can be seen painting a small painting through the window of a modestly decorated cabin on the mountain. With all the people who clap when some mostly vengeful violence happens in the scene, those who do not clap may feel no other people are clapping. I hear you. It seems reasonable to stare at a painting for at least as long as it takes the painter to make it, and also reasonable to stare for approximately as long as it takes the sun to rise and set. I told my father being blessed was vaguely more dependent on the whims of God. I'd rather be lucky. The girl in the well was put there in the name of a God created by farming people. The boy fell. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah. Those were both great. I'm going to read a poem now by Carl Phillips, who was awarded the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry last night and uh, is one of our most distinguished poets. It's called Sing a Darkness. Slowly the fog did what fog does, eventually. It lifted, the way veils tend to at some point in epic verse, so that the hero can see the divinity at work constantly behind all things mortal. Or that's the idea, anyway. I'm not saying I do or don't believe that. I'm not even sure that belief can change any of it, at least in terms of the facts of how, moment by moment, any life unfurls. We can call it fate or call it just what happened what happens while we're busy trying to describe or explain what happens, how a mimosa tree caught growing close beside a house gets described as hugging the house, for example, as if an impulse to find affection everywhere made us have to put it there, a spell against indifference, as if that were the worst thing. Is it? Isn't it? The fog lifted. It was early spring still, the dogwood brandis those pollen-laden buds that precede a flowering. History, what survives or doesn't. How the healthiest huddled as much at least as was possible, more closely together to give the sick more room. How they mostly all died all the same. I was nowhere I'd ever been before. Nothing mattered. I practiced standing as still as I could for as long as I could. Mm. Mm. Um, Terrence, I love the idea of standing in front of the painting as long as they took the heart to make it. Yeah, um, we should all suffer that much to look. Um, this poem is called Notes Toward an Elegy. Um, not all of my bombs are sad, but you know, you're going to hear some of the sadder ones. Um, but I think this one in connection with both of those accidentally is also about, um, the kind of the art that like erupts from every everyday moments. That sounds so cliched, but like these little spikes of things that stick in your mind. Um, and this takes place in, uh, mostly in Cyprus, uh, where I was for a while. The Cypriot sun is impatient, a woman undressed who can't spare the time to dress, so light like a vitrine holds even a storm. One day in the old city, a pineapple rain. And I'm on my way home from the pharmacy, carrying my little bag of cures. <laughs> Refuge at the cafe in the nameless square. Nehal brings espresso poured over ice, turns off the music. We listen to rain fall through the light until the end. White wine greening in a glass, lion rampant in the sky. Moon reclined gorgeous in her silver shift, polished newels door askew in its frame. Hot mornings, 
hot apple tea honeyed, the mountains a fist knuckled on the horizon. Dust is coming, dust is not yet here. Whenever her hands dance, I tell her how beautiful. She says there's so much other movement I do not perceive, and I accept the presence of dances invisible to me. Figs in the tree, figs on the stones, stains of rotting fruit spread in shadow at the sun's whim, that steady dissolution of body into form that signals the progress of a masterpiece. Copper bowl in her hand, in the bowl in the hands, olive leaves burn. I ask her to read to me. I like the way her voice handles words. What will she read? First she laughs. It's a good day to laugh. The coffee is strong and the light. Why read when we can talk, when all our friends are here? My perversity is silence, a shudder stops in the throat. When all the time I hear her voice, I am glad my soul met your soul. Examples of what I do not know. It's just that for a time I took love out walking with me everywhere, and sometimes I thought, child, whose is this child, when it played in the square, a sunshine creature terrifying. Yet still I looked at it like I've never looked at a stranger who promises water to the waterless for nothing. And now I lie awake pretending everyone in the world lies still the way the living are still, not entirely, never entirely. Eva. Sumi. Greeny. Mind greening in the glass, we all, we know. Okay, um, I, I was like, do artists change the titles of their paintings? Because as I look at this uh, poem that I'm gonna read to you, it's called, What Would You Ask the Artist? But it probably shouldn't have had a different title. It shouldn't have been something like Meditations on Blue or something. Um, the first part I am thinking about Matisse's Blue, which is almost like kind of, you know, in Icarus, that, that his favorite blue for the collages. Thinking about that, what would you ask the artist? And then the second half of the poem is thinking about Picasso's blue. Uh, and it just out, it grew out of thinking about Matisse's blue. So that's, that's a little long one. Let's see how it goes. I'm like, it's a forum, but we'll just read it. Uh, what would you ask the artist? Uh, this is so the first, just to Matisse. Dear painter, can you share how you made the blue we find in certain of your paintings? Sometimes I catch it throwing a goddish glow over everything in the eye of a storm covered in lightning. I fear without you, the color will not be seen again, except perhaps inside us, where the bones hold its mercurial shades in them. Matisse, sir, did your brushes have the blues in them? Where else might the remains be found? We sometimes find the color in denim when rain dampens it, once or twice making love when I closed my eyes, I found myself in a tabernacle of the hue you have left hanging on the walls around us. Hello, goat, master of the show. I have very little use for blueberries, blue jays, skies, sapphire, the hymns in the garments of policemen, but the lines we see hand-painted on porcelain come close. I might use it on a mean boss or in cases of chaos or rapture, and if I fell into darkness, I would gaze upon it and thank you. Mid-fall, Icarus shows how a misstep expands behind you, how one, can how one can come to a conclusion using the wrong calculus. The man who covered his coins in honey before eating them in gooseberries also turned a distasteful blue. The ennui we wish to cover and uncover and free and contain, as in how hard it is to describe your own accent as in the way the bluest eye has so much blackness in it. If people born in a season of ice are usually crawling by summer, how much do you suppose that determines their general disposition? Above us are constellations of soul needs for guidance, the anthems of sawdust and approximation. As if in matters of our own bodies, we are our least reliable witnesses. You find upon exit the tombs of desuetude painters used in the exhibit. 
I was born for this moment because this is the moment I was born, you say. It is always the color of history. Can you share how you made the blues outlast and outline us? How long did you swim or drown or float or swallow them, esteemed ghost? Henri, if I may. Henri, Henri, Henri. <laughs> and then this is the part, Envoy of Picasso's Blue. Very different kind of feel to it. The first drawing Pablo Picasso made as a toddler with a single blue crayon on onion skin made his father, an average painter, weep. And weep again, showing the drawing to Picasso's mother, who also wept. The drawing was said to have been lost after the death of Picasso's sister, Conchita, of diphtheria, when the family moved to Barcelona. But it reappeared years later, somewhere you'd never expect. To truly grasp any of Picasso's later work, you should know whether the sister's death conjured a bird's or bullseye view of loss and faith, and if the experience instilled a constant mysterious feeling in him whether everything that happens to the artist before age nine or 10, or even before nine or 10 a.m. influences whether an instrument is held like a tool or a weapon. Loss, like desire, is always in the eye of the maker and beholder. Picasso, of course, grew to make many more haunted, perceptive scenes, but the stranger who found the drawing had no idea who made it only that the lines in blue crayon on onion paper conjured a mysterious feeling in him. It looks somehow like a perfectly drawn landscape, said the neighbor, resting his hand on his garden fence, thinking the stranger showing him a drawing in the middle of the day, slightly stranger than before. Returning to his dirt when the stranger left, the neighbor felt something come over his eyes, a quixotic quaking in all his blind spots. He spent the rest of his days trying to describe it. It was a depiction of the body's geometries, the eye doctor replied when the stranger asked his opinion. He sent the stranger home after an inconclusive eye exam and then went home to bed himself. The doctor closed his eyes around his tears and slept for six or seven days, dreaming of nudes, posing before a surgeon with a palette knife. When the stranger got home and showed the drawing to his wife, she said it was clearly a portrayal of liberty, the artist marking the presence of God, she explained, pausing over the thickest of the lines and asking why and which heartbreaks can conjure the opposite of faith and time. Her hair, the stranger noticed, was no longer as it was when she was his bride. Blind spots always leave a stain, the wife said after dinner, though the stranger had long put the drawing away. She kept trying to describe what she seen, how not to disappear completely, she said, lying in bed while her husband, the stranger, saw the drawing burning in a nightmare. It was clearly a tale about slaves. The drawing, the, the artist was suffering a notion of color. The wife cried herself to sleep that night and dreamed she was being covered in waves of salt and water and gold the ephemera of souls lost between African and American shores, a blue between the sky and shark parlor, lovely as the loveliest of the sisters to leap into the waters and live free as the bride of the sea. Mm. Wonderful. I'm gonna read a poem by a poet who's also very alive to visual art. And uh, it's his 100th birthday this year, James Schuyler. Mm. This is called Song. Light lies layered in the leaves, trees and trees, more trees. A cloud boy brings the evening paper, the evening sun. It sets. Not sharply or at once, a stately progress down the sky, its gilt and pink and faintly green, above, beyond, behind the evening leaves of trees. Traffic sounds and bells resound in silver clangs, the hour, a tune, my friend Pierrot, the violet hour, 
the grass is violet green. A weeping beech is gray, a copper beech is copper red. Tennis nets hang unused in unused stillness. A car starts up and whispers into what will soon be night. A tennis ball is served. A horsefly vanishes. A smoking cigarette. A day, so many and so few, dies down a hardened sky and leaves our lap-held notebook leaves, discriminated barely in light no longer layered. Mm. Um, I was really struck by how much both of those poems travel in small spaces from the ostensible beginning of them. Um, this poem that I'm going to read, I hope, also travels. <laughs> Um, but uh, it quite literally travels. It starts in Cabo Rojo in Puerto Rico, um, and it's called Puente de Piedra, which means bridge of stone. Um, and there's a natural formation in Cabo Rojo that's quite famous that is like an arch from a, out from the cliff that creates like... Um, I actually feel like it looks much less like a bridge because it then ends in the sea than it does like a uh, kind of window. Um, but this is the this is the inspiring uh, space. Wearing white to make of myself a friend to those who haunt the sunlight, I clamber down limestone steps to a crescent of stones a beach made by the waves rolling and breaking and patterns governed by forces you may know intimately now if you have survived death. What can I describe that you have not seen, if you do see? A philosopher tells me that I am thinking of everything in the wrong way. What is survive? What is death? What? If he means to stump me, it can't work. To survive is to wake up early and for a period no longer than 20 to 60 seconds not remember that you are dead. To survive is to pray this interstice repeats every morning for the rest of my otherwise unendurable life. And death, I smile enigmatically. Death to philosophers, what do you think of that? He disappears, mosquito in the bladed breeze. This bridge of stone is natural. In specifying, I realize that most bridges are unnatural, so to speak, and I would like a substitute word unspoiled by human structures if you have one in a language that perhaps you now know, even if every word will sound like wind to me. I could learn the names of all the winds, at least. Even alive, I could. An arch from cliffside into the sea, through which the sea, through which the sea. A portal to where the dead survive, I am describing to you, I understand now, which you have already recognized from the other side. I am waving, I am waving from the shore. I am dressed in white. From your vantage, can you see if you do see? How others who have come here, living or dead, I do not presume to guess, have made piles of stones in white and pink and umber and the exact shade of a mountain riverbed, and interspersed among the stones also white, world coral, dead. If I pass under the bridge, what then? Do you answer in the wind or the waves or the stone or the silence? Do you care? Do you care to answer? Scraping the stones on the seabed with my fingers as far down as I can go, eyes closed. How this particular dark is, is or could be like surviving death, where everything you can't see is what you touch. Tonight, as perhaps you know, though I do not yet, I will ascend a bridge of stars, that are in fact fluorescent lights strung at intervals according to an engineer's logic, 
to prevent some dying on my way to the other side of the island, surviving, a young boy gathering stones and shells to show me one after another described as if I couldn't see, I didn't, the wondrous characteristics for which you chose these among all the world and these treasures, like me, unaware. And death. Uh, were I just a little quicker to turn my head, might I see you there? In form, perhaps something like the changeable blue no one living can describe, certainly not me. This language I do not have yet. Kidding me. I'm going to stop citing lines here from the poems. <laughs> What was the dark when you touch everything you can't see? I think that's pretty interesting too. Okay, uh, I'm just gonna read a quick little sonnet here. Um, it's called American Sonnet for the New Year, but again, with titles, it could be called American Sonnet for now. Um, so it doesn't have anything to do with art, it's just for where we are right now. American Sonnet for the moment, maybe, I don't know. Um, and adverbs is what I would say, <laughs> adverb, okay. Things got terribly, ugly, incredibly quickly. Things got ugly embarrassingly quickly, actually. Things got ugly unbelievably quickly, honestly. Things got ugly seemingly infrequently, initially. Things got ugly ironically, usually awfully carefully. Things got ugly unsuccessfully, occasionally. Things got ugly mostly painstakingly, quietly, seemingly. Things got ugly dutifully, infrequently. Things got ugly sadly, especially frequently, unfortunately. Things got ugly increasingly, obviously. Things got ugly suddenly, embarrassingly, forcefully. Things got really ugly regularly, truly quickly. Things got really incredibly ugly. Things will get less ugly, inevitably. I hope you're right. Yes, yeah, the Volta. We got the last word is the Volta. <laughs> Wait and see. I am going to read a poem by Louise Glick, who died a week ago today, very quickly, very tragically. And uh, I have to find it, Tom, but. Um, It's a very, today was actually the day of her memorial. So I'd like to read this, um, but I have to find it. I'm sorry. Um, um, and she was a teacher of Elisa. So Le Elisa knew her very, very well. She was. Um, I'm glad we can... For one out two. Nobody's going to read the Purple Maid this suit, right? I'm going to read that. Oh, are you? No, I have a different one. Look. <laughs> oh, you're, I'm so glad you're reading this. This is a poem from her last book. It's called Afternoons and Early Evenings. The beautiful golden days when you were soon to be dying, but could still enter into random conversations with strangers. Random, but also deliberate so impressions of the world were still forming and changing you, and the city was at its most radiant, uncrowded in summer, though by then everything was happening more slowly. Boutiques, restaurants, a little wine shop with a striped awning. Once a cat was sleeping in a doorway. It was cool there in the shadows, and I thought I would like to sleep like that again, to have in my mind not one thought. And later, we would eat polpo and saganaki, the waiter cutting leaves of oregano into a saucer of oil. What was it, six o'clock? So when we left, it was still light and everything could be seen for what it was. And then you got in, and then you got in the car. Where did you go next after those days? 
where although you could not speak, you were not lost. Um, I'm going to read the poem that actually immediately follows that poem in Winter Recipes for the collect Collective, her last book. Um, so this is the last poem in her last her last book, and um, I would I just I don't know if I would be a poet without Louise. Um, it's hard sometimes with teachers to know if they give you something or if they bring forth something that was already there or both. Um, but uh, it is hard to believe that there will be no more poems, um, but very grateful for all the poems that exist. Um, this one is called Song. Leo Cruz makes the most beautiful white bowls. I think I must get some to you. But how is the question in these times? He is teaching me the names of the desert grasses. I have a book since to see the grasses is impossible. Leo thinks the things man makes are more beautiful than what exists in nature, and I say no. And Leo says, wait and see. We make plans to walk the trails together. When, I ask him, when? Never again. That is what we do not say. He is teaching me to live an imagination. A cold wind blows as I cross the desert. I can see his house in the distance. Smoke is coming from the chimney. That is the kiln, I think. Only Leo makes porcelain in the desert. Ah, he says, you are dreaming again. And I say, then I'm glad I dream the fire is still alive. Right before, please come on in here, phone. <laughs> um, right before, about a week before she passed, can we get a signal? Here we go. I was um, talking to my students. Is this the poem? Yeah. Yeah. About. Um, always looking up and to the right in the poems, like that, to the beloved, to your grandmother, to your mother, to your father, always in this direction and saying, but sometimes you want to look like somewhere else. And Louise being a great example of that, of other kinds of feelings and poems, and I love this poem for that reason. So I, I was showing it to him, just talking about it, and we wound up, you know, talking more extensively about it this week, obviously. But I want to read you this one. This is my favorite poem, one of my favorite poems of hers. Purple Bathing Suit. I like watching you garden with your back to me in your purple bathing suit. Your back is my favorite part of you, the part furthest away from your mouth. <laughs> you might give some thought to that mouth, also to the way you wing, breaking the grass off at ground level when you should put it by the roots. How many times do I have to tell you how the grass spreads? your little pile notwithstanding, in a dark mass, which by smoothing over the surface, you have finally fully obscured. Watching you stare into space in the tidy rolls in the vegetable garden, ostensibly working hard while actually doing the worst job possible. I think you are a small, irritating, purple thing. And I would like to see you walk off the face of the earth because you are all that's wrong with my life. And I need you, and I play you. Awesome. So now I think we should ask 
our artists to tell a little about Sally. You're going to go first. I've, um, I've almost finished writing another book, another book that I swore I was never going to write, another goddamn book that I was never going to write. But anyway, I've done it, and, and um, this is just a, a page um, from it, um, the second chapter. It's a sort of... Um, sort of a how-to or how-not-to book, um, and it's written to young artists um, from an old one. And this chapter is called Early Promise. You've heard this before. Those whom the gods wish to destroy, they first call promising, right? As a young woman, girl, actually, 17 when I started taking pictures, it would appear that I didn't have a thing to worry about from the gods. My total lack of promise is exhibit number one in the prosecution of my argument here that it is work, work, work that makes an artist. Proust became Proust that way, indeed furiously working himself to death. But you don't have to do that. Don't kill yourself in your cork-lined room. Don't be Mozart dying from exhaustion at 35. Just put your head down and steadily, resolutely, pull the load. I came from good, solid peasant stock. Short-waisted, thick-fingered, durable as all fuck. I have learned that even if on some uninspired days I can't create, I can always make work. It's hard to shrug on the harness and break the furrow, but once I start, I feel a dray horse satisfaction that is just a few rows away from something else. Call it revelation, creative ecstasy, incipient perfection, serendipity, call it art. Not right off the bat, though. In my case, I struggled to even locate the harness, never mind step between the traces and gee all my crooked rows. I tried everything, painting, pottery, etching, jewelry making, poetry, tie-dye, and hardly a glimmer of hope was perceived by anyone, especially me, and we were right. If you are so unlucky as to be told that you have promised by some lying art room sycophant trying to get into your pants, please, for God's sake, don't believe it. Get thee away, Satan. Instead, allow your malignant insecurities, and of course you have them, to kick your lazy ass into gear. I had this figured out at age 18, and this is where there's an actual illustration in the book of my journal entry, so I can't show that. When my journal entries made clear that I pragmatically decided that insecurity, with which I'm still awash to the front teeth, could be my friend, art complicit, perhaps even essential to the process. And it also appears that with my profound <laughs> self-doubt, my overdeveloped sense of independence and old-fashioned cussedness, art might be the most desirable life path for me, indeed, maybe the only path. Basically, from near infancy, I wanted to choose myself what I was going to do with every aspect of my life, driving my mother to near hysteria by my adamantine refusal to wear clothes. Having then conceded to underpants, Footwear became my thermopylae, and I took my stand and held to it, defeating socks, shoelaces, and the not infrequent hairbrush to the butt. The despair in my mother's journals of the time help explain the resultant hand hands-off approach she adopted for the remaining years spent raising her young porcupine. Nobody was going to boss me around from the first moment I learned I could emit an adult frazzling shriek. For sure, you don't have to be an egocentric, bossy, arrogant, insecurity-riddled asshole to be an artist. In fact, that's unwise for a number of reasons. For one thing, there are only so many Larry Manns that you can find to put up with you. But I'm willing to posit that if you possess the stubbornness and defiance that damn near drove my mother over the ledge, you can make it work to your advantage in the art-making process. By the age of 21, when I responded to my mother's well-meaning suggestion that I get an actual paying job by asserting that I'd rather eat crabgrass than work at something I didn't love, 
They had no reason whatsoever to doubt me. And what I loved was taking pictures. What a joy, what an absolute joy to be in this room with these fierce friends, new friends, and to hear these voices. It's such a such an extraordinary privilege to be with you tonight. It really is. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for coming and being part of this tonight. I'm 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 reading um, a short text that I wrote um, two years ago um, called Perdendosi, which is Perdendosi is the dying fall, musical dying fall. And I wrote this during the worst part of the pandemic and etc. After the leaves have fallen, we return to a plain sense of things, wrote Wallace Stevens. He knew about return. He knew that you need to come back into a room to see something again, need to listen to a blackbird, to Peter Quince playing a clavier. Sometimes I think his attunement to winter, to snow, to porcelain, is here in this understanding for the need for only a few leaves, for the time after they have fallen. You cannot listen to the whole full canopy of a tree in the same way as the sound of the wind in the sound of a few leaves, which is the sound of the land. So you pick up a few leaves and you are taken back to childhood to picking up one special leaf and then another and then a better one. This is skeletal. This is on fire. And perhaps if you are inclined, you put one down in order to give it space. See how it holds itself, how it touches a surface and lifts. To understand the singular in this endless plurality. You cannot count them as the wind keeps the leaves coming down you can thread your life in this, in autumns, the fall of leaves, Proust's leaves are cadenced, childhood afternoons under a chestnut tree in Combray, slowly altering in form and dappled with a pattern of chestnut leaves, of your silent, sonorous, fragrant, limpid hours, he writes, the patterns of the shadows becoming part of those early stories. What had to move? A leaf of the chestnut tree, for instance, moved. Autumn in the Bois de Boulogne and a walk to a temple where the doorway holds an oblation of autumn leaves threaded with gold because leaves are oblation. No one owes them. No one can hold leaves. In nothing gold can stay, Frost says, leaf subsides to leaf and makes leaf rhyme with grief. And this feels right Melancholic, the perdendosi of leaves falling, is that of the four last songs, the twittering of the swallows about to depart. That strain again, it had a dying fall, but melancholy is dangerous territory. Walter Benjamin said of melancholia that he came into the world under the sign of Saturn, the star of the slowest revolution, the planet of detours and delays, and I know this. The dying fall extends. The delay is a holding on. I play the music again, again. The leaves hold the idea of holding on. Each light, each leaf falls as if it were motioning no, writes Rilke, who I then read again and again. And I think that as I get older, I realize that this is hard, that leaves segue into the act of leaving, which takes me to Paul Celan and his poetry of leaving place language structure, family, leaf, treeless, he writes, which says bereft, lost. And why do I find this first word capitalized so moving? It gives the word some space, a little weight, just a little but enough. Leaves lose trees like people lose countries. And leaves are paper, of course, of course they are. So that ablation, that fall, is also the fall of words. You write on what is to hand. Emily Dickinson writes on scraps of envelopes, receipts, torn fragments of paper. 
This is frugality. It is using what is to hand, a picking up of scraps, as a quilter in New England might, but the trees unhooked themselves from trees and started all abroad. The dust did scoop itself like hands and throw away the road, which might mean that it is not being able to control leaves that holds their power, that they are a throwing away, a throwing into the air of possibility, the abroadness of poetry. Words fall like leaves circling and spinning, lifting and settling, and in their end is their beginning, says Goethe. He spends years thinking about leaves, writes his treatise, an attempt to interpret the metamorphosis of plants. Everything is leaf, he writes in 1787, in a letter, which is to say that everything is leaf. Every part of a plant is leaf. The cotyledon, the foliage, the caterpillars, the petals. A plant is fundamentally leaf. He collects the leaves of a ginkgo tree and writes a poem about love and pastes two of them onto manuscripts and send it on to Marianne. And under the almost bare branches of an oak tree, an oak tree in a beech forest, a tree with only a few leaves hanging on, he writes Wanderer's Night Song and sends it to his friend and signs it and dates it and places it at the slope of Ettersburg, the 12th of February, 1776. And Schubert sets this to music, a song of letting go, the descent, the pardon doci of leaves and the Ettersburg beech forests are cleared in 1937 to make way for Buchenwald, the concentration camp. Goethe Eicher, his oak, is preserved and it is named. It stands in the center of the camp. And on 24th of August, 1944, the camp is bombed and the oak burns all night long and the government casts its stump in concrete after the war. It has a plaque. It has no leaves. In, we are surrounded by poetry, and, and, and this is the last poem, I believe. Um, and actually, um, this is wonderful. In this beautiful anthology, Jonathan has put right at the very end of the book Seamus Heaney's Postscript, which is one of my very, very famous, favorite, favorite poems of all time. And actually, these installations here and this one here have the words scattered through them. One miracle after another, tonight. <laughs> and some time, make time to drive out west into County Clare along the flaggy shore in September or October, when the wind and the light are working off each other so that the ocean on one side is wild with foam and glitter, and inland among stones the surface of a slate-grey lake is lit by the earth lightning of a flock of swans, their feathers rough and ruffling white on white, their fully grown headstrong-looking heads tucked or cresting, or busy underwater. Useless to think your park and capture it more thoroughly. You are neither here nor there, a hurry through which known and strained things pass, as big soft buffetings come at the car sideways and catch the heart off guard and blow it open. And, 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 blowing it open is I think tonight that thank you so much. Yeah.